Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar on the fourth open call. Um, this is actually our second webinar on the uh, fourth open call. Um, the previous uh, webinar was held in July. Um, and we'll be recording this webinar because uh, today the, the group is rather small, um, but we had a lot of interest in, in um, from the community, but many people couldn't attend today. Um, so, but thank, thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, so in terms of the agenda for today, um, Ruben, can you go to the next? slide do you want to share yourself the no no screen? you you oh. can go okay you can go ahead okay so uh the in the first segment we're going to um uh, describe a little bit about the fourth open call uh in, introduce that uh, next slide um on the background and the priority topics um and uh then after that, um, I'll follow with um, a description of the National Science Foundation Dear Colleague Letter and some other opportunities for US funding. And then we're gonna spend a good bit of time on uh, some questions that have already been supplied to us um, during the, the registration and also some frequently asked questions and some lessons learned from our first three open calls. Uh, so with that, now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ruben, who's going to give a, an in, introduction to the fourth open call. Thanks, Ruben. Thank you, Jim. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on your, on your time zone. Um, so today uh, we will uh, talk about the uh, fourth open call and uh, we may we mainly focus on a Q&A session with your question and also the um, frequently asked questions that we have collected uh, in the last months. Uh, but first, let me um, shortly introduce uh, our project, ngsvisor.eu. Uh, we started the project in January 2020 last year, and uh, the project will last until uh, June in next year, 2022. Uh, we have a total, the whole, uh, whole project, it's uh, five open calls uh, with a total budget of 2.8 million uh, euro budget. Um, each project uh, funding can range between 25,000 uh, euros, 75,000 euros for a minimum of three uh, months to a maximum of six months. Uh, uh, so far, we have completed three open call out of five, and right now we are running the four open call. Just a few numbers about the, uh, the year and a half we have been running the projects. Uh, as you can see here, um, we had a total number of applications of 75 applications, and we awarded 20 of them. Uh, the total requested budget was over 9 million euros, and we allocated uh, a little bit more than 2 million. Especially if you see on the left, uh, our ratio that for each open call, like in the last three open call was uh, around uh, one out of four, the average. Uh, and this is actually a, a very good ratio for us because in general, all the um, other H2020 projects have a ratio of uh, one out of 20. Sorry, just a second. Okay. Currently we are running the Ford Open Call. Uh, just a second, okay. Uh, currently, we're running the four open call um, that are open um, three months ago, and uh, it will last until the 15th September, so next Wednesday. So all the applicants, we have time until next Wednesday, 15th September, 5 p.m. Central European Summer Time to submit their applications. Um, how to submit the application? It's quite easy. After you have um, registered to the website that I'm, I'm quite sure that all of you here have, uh, otherwise, there's a dedicated registration page, quite easy to find the website. Once you have registered and logged in, um, on your top menu bar, uh, you have your user uh, options. And the, next to my profile, you have my dashboard option. And if you click on it, you will go to your personal dashboard, where uh, it will present you all the um, current uh, open calls of the projects. For example, in this case, of course, we are um, running the four open call that uh, one you would find. You click on, on apply now and it will get you to the form 
Um, the form will look like the part on the left. So you have all the fields where you have to fill in your information. And uh, uh, once you at the very bottom where you have two different options, you have save draft on the left and submit your application on the right. Uh, please, until your application is not ready to be submitted, just use the save draft options and you can just go back as many times you want to edit your, uh, your application. And only once your application is ready to be submitted, just submit your application because once it's submitted, you won't be uh, able to do any further edits. Um, one specific thing, because we have been asked this a few times um, about the word limits. So in some of the fields, you will see that it says maximum length about 600 words, some others say 300 words. Uh, these limits are uh, uh, like we are quite flexible. So they're kind of suggestion of, um, you know, just for to help then the um, evaluators to, you know, to ease their job in evaluating your, um, your applications. Uh, but it's just suggestion, but of course, please try to stay as close as possible to that number. Uh, um, one last thing, if you are looking for partners, we have the Twinning Lab as well. We have been, we are listing like uh, projects from Europe and United States. So you can exchange and you can contact directly the coordinator through the platform. Um, also uh, in the future, in the near future, actually we are uh, reshaping this platform in, uh, in a showcase for different projects that are related to, uh, to the NGI uh, world. Uh, one very last thing, you can find all the information on our Twitter page on the left. The handle is uh, NG Atlantic. Uh, but also, if you haven't done it yet, please uh, subscribe to our newsletter because um, every time we have some news or some events or something new about the open calls, this is, uh, we will send a newsletter to all um, the subscribed of, uh, and, and our community. Said so, um, I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, Christina, that she will um, explain you uh, more in deep the four open call and especially the, the topics. Thank you very much, Christina, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone, thanks a lot. And uh, if you don't mind keeping on sharing the screen or, or I can take the screen so that uh, you can let you uh, I'll take this screen so that maybe you can let yes. the other participants in. Here you go. Okay, you can see my screen, right? Yes, maybe pre presentation mode. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so now we'll dive a little bit more into the um, priority topics of the fourth goal. Um, it, so in terms of the topics, first of all, let me say that we have a lot of information quite detailed available, of course, on the call page on the website, which is uh, this link that you can see here. And also we have uh, information concerning the um, NSF Dear Colleague Letter um, funding on the NSF page. Uh, you also have th this uh, webinar, as you know, will be recorded, and you can also access the recording of the previous webinar, uh, which was in uh, July, and uh, there was a, an extensive workshop in uh, June, which is also available online, and it was pretty interesting because we had speakers um, discussing also about, about the topics. Um, for the types of proposal submission, we are addressing two categories. One is the EU-US experimental platforms interconnection, and one is um, related to experiments with key enabling technologies in five different NGI topics. We are mirroring, in fact, what's going on in the NGI initiative in itself. Um, so what we do is we look into uh, bringing the results already available from other NGI initiatives or, or from uh, communities working on NGI across Europe. And, um, and so we, we, ex we experiment, we, uh, sorry, we bring the results of these experiments within the topic covered. And, um, but of course the, the open calls are open for any, uh, any applicants, you don't need necessarily to have previous 
uh, involvement in other NGI initiatives. Um, we have included also a couple of new topics in this uh, for open call in order to also match uh, the NSF. In fact, the NSF now have a funding program for US partners, which is aligned with ours, and we have involved them uh, by, and, and we have added also these, these two new topics. So let's now, uh, let's now go into the detail of the topics. The category A is quite different from the category B because it's not necessarily about performing um, the experiment, but just enable platforms to connect, to interconnect with each other across uh, EU and US. Um, so it is mainly related, it is mainly uh, directed to established designers and facility providers of experimental infrastructures, testbeds, and platforms. Um, so, the, of course, the objective here is to enable experimentation in the NGI areas on both sides of the Atlantic to interconnect with each other, which in fact is the core of our project in collaboration be between EU and US. Um, of course, um, it would be expected this facility then could be used for the experimentation on NGI projects. That doesn't mean that it is excluded to other projects, but of course, it, it is expected that it's made available for the use with NGI projects. Uh, category B, sorry, one is about opening uh, open internet architecture renovation. Uh, it will focus on experiments supporting communities of developers in ensuring uh, the internet architecture evolution toward better efficiency, security, scalability, and resilience. Um, again, uh, in this case, uh, I mean, we, we are mainly focused on results coming from various projects in, uh, in NGI. For example, there was a call on using NGI pointer. Um, so uh, this is uh, the, the call where, we, um, where you can experiment the results of this uh, on this topic. Topic B2 is about strengthening trustworthiness and resilience of the internet. Um, when we talk about strengthening trustworthiness, uh, it can include identity, authentication, and authorization, also traceability, privacy, confidentiality, um, also cryptographic solutions, transparency and accountability, federated, collaborative, or decentralized technologies for supporting the internet wide e identities, but also resilience, resilience issues. We include, uh, for example, approaches for monitoring, detection, and mitigation uh, to counter large scale disruptions or failure or uh, ongoing impending cyber attack intrusion or support from crisis situations. Um, again, this, the same as we have said before applies that this is related to the experimentation of results in these sectors. Uh, the service and data portability. Um, there was a call here from, from our sister Array Ace, which was NGI DAPC, is focused, is funding uh, open calls on this topic. And we focus on, again on the experimentation of results in this field, um, mainly related on the challenge of personal data portability on the internet. Um, so, related, of course, to the GDPR regulation and uh, separation of data from the services provided to the end user. And also here we, we focus on, uh, for example, the standardization of personal profile, handling of data sets, uh, as well as techno legal constraint and simplification on end user contracts in terms of use. Now, uh, the fourth topic is one which is not included uh, aside from our project in the NGI family, apart from um, and, I mean, it was mentioned in uh, NGI Forward with this white paper as a, um, as a key topic um, for the sustainable and climate friendly, uh, inter for, for a key NGI topic for a better, more human centric future internet. So, um, in line with this, we have opened this new topic. Uh, it's focused on results related to use case implementations of innovative internet technologies and uh, fight against climate change, uh, awareness of environmental impact of the internet, promotion of technologies to 
help reduce the energy consumption and carbon emissions. Finally, um, this fifth topic, it was requested uh, by the NSF, and we would like to point out here that this is more related to data sharing um, rather than service applications. Um, so it will address the challenge of sharing network data siloed in different internet regions across geographic boundaries and enabling trusted internet services by composition and orchestration of globally distributed services. In particular, it will address secure and privacy preserving data sharing, sharing of internet data to support continuous monitoring and data driven analysis, experiments related to, uh, to this cross domain data sharing challenges to enable cyber threat identification, risk assessment and incident management, and also secure and interoperable internet services. Um, as I already mentioned, this that uh, is more related to, to the role of data sharing for the purposes of heavily on cybersecurity rather than services and applications. Um, and now I pass the floor to Jim for uh, the US partner funding opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I'll just share. Um, can you just release the sharing? on your side, please. Yes. OK. Thank you. OK. I just need to figure out how to do the presentation. On the right side, next to share. Yes, yes. Uh, so share, here. present. Um, yes, present. OK, thank you. Welcome. Okay, um, just before I start on the user uh, US partner funding opportunities, I just want to say that um, <clears throat> the topics that, that uh, Christina presented um, shouldn't really be considered in silo mode only. Uh, there's been a number of questions, and I, I'll probably cover it later again, but uh, the, there's been a number of questions about, you know, if our project covers, you know, one or more of these topics, then that's absolutely fine. You can just explain in your proposal, you know, how it's covering one or more. And um, moreover, the A and B topics, they can also be combined. Okay, so if, if you have um, an ex two experimental, uh, mature experimental platforms coming together and they find out about some NGI results, maybe from some industry partner or you know um, research partner, and they join together. That's absolutely fine as well. So they can cover you know A plus B, you know so it could be A A plus B two or A plus B two and B three, you know it can be some combination of um, of those. Okay, so you know please keep that in mind as well. Okay, so um, <clears throat> how are the U.S. partners? Um, Jim, just a second before you continue. We already have one question from, uh, two questions actually, from Martin Serrano on okay. the main chat. Do you want to reply later or just to let you know that? Y yes, I can, I can answer it now. So um, in times of COVID-19 or post, um, expecting all those well, is it expected to have a presence in the USA or everything? Well, it's, uh, it, it all depends, Martin, on how things are going. Um, you know, for example, the, the U.S. still has not lifted their their uh, uh, travel ban on EU Shenzhen countries and, and other EU member states uh, like Ireland, UK, etc. So, and it's not clear when that will happen. So, I will cover it a little bit later about how um, we're treating the travel uh, budget um, and that we do have flexibility so that if you put in for extra travel or if you put in for travel budget and then for some reason you can't use it, you can, you can move that over into personnel uh, because you're doing the job remotely. Um, it does the combination of more than one topic or to provide more points. Um, it, it really, um, I wouldn't say it will provide more points per se. I, I would just say that explain it well. And then, you know, if your ideas are, you know, are explained very well, you should hopefully get, you know, more points. But, but the fact that you have 
you know, two instead of one, I, I, I can't really, you know, guarantee that that will get you more points. Um, okay. So th thank you for that, Martin. Um, so <clears throat> the um, starting with our third open call, we were very pleased to have um, a joint uh, program with the National Science Foundation, uh, which was launched in February as a Dear Colleague Letter, or DCL, as, as they call it. And the, the DCL is a very efficient um, uh, instrument that the NSF have in that um, organizations that already have a grant can, you know, through their existing grant, they can apply very quickly for this DCL, which is a supplemental fund for additional activities that will then be funded on top of their um, existing grant. Okay, so um, I'll provide the website for, for it later, but just in summary, um, this is what you will see on the website. It's open to all active NSF funded researchers within the NSF's computer and network systems uh, core program and the secure and trustworthy um, cyberspace uh, programs, which basically uh, include most of the wired and wireless programs and cloud programs uh, in the NSF. So it is, it is kind of a, a very wide range of uh, programs uh, and participants in, in those programs that could avail of this DCL. Uh, the, the way it works is the funding available is up to 100,000 US dollars or 20% of the original grant budget um, of, of their original grant for a duration of one year. And the duration of the project must fall within the period of their existing grant period. So if their existing grant is finishing next month, then it, unfortunately it, it would be rejected if it was applied for um, at the end of this um, uh, open call. Then uh, one thing that they have insisted is that the proposers, um, they still have to explain how their US partners will fund their activities independently from the DCL. And the reason for this is because their, um, the, the DCL proposals have their own evaluation process, which I'll explain in a moment, um, that will take place outside of you know, um, our um, evaluation process. And there's no guarantee it will be successful. So um, that's why we, we have to insist that the, the US partners still must um, explain that you know they, they're committing to the work even if they do not finally receive their funding through the, the DCL. And uh, the supplemental funding requests are subject to the NSF's merit review process, um, which I'll talk about a bit more. Um, and the other thing that um, we need to point out, and this was actually uh, coming mainly from the European Commission side, that there will be no difference will be done in the evaluation process between proposals with the NSF DCL funded partners and the others. Okay, so in other words, you don't get extra points if you have an NSF DCL in your proposal. So all the proposals have uh, equal opportunities and will be selected based exclusively on their merits. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, so the, the deadline for submission of the supplemental funding requests is within um, one week of any of our open call deadline. So that means um, um, for open call four, excuse me, uh, for the typo, It'll have to be submitted by the 22nd of September, 2021. And we can help with this because um, you know, we've been through it before and it's very straightforward. So don't, you know, don't worry, we, we can help your US partner um, with this. So there's four, four things that they look for, but um, when I'm through with it, you'll be happy to know that there's actually only three or I think potentially two. So, what the DCL normally looks for is a summary of the active research award, including the original research vision goals, activities, and accomplishments spanning the intellectual merit and how this award is related to the proposed work in NG Atlantic. 
this is about a page and it's a, it's a uh, I, I, as I understand, it's done online, so the U.S. partners know how to do it. The project description that was submitted to the NGI Atlantic Open Call, and then the third one is the bio sketch of the EU lead partner, one page. In our negotiations with the NSF, they have agreed to accept the PDF version from our platform. Okay, so that's why I say we've actually cut down um, from four to three items. And one of those items is provided um, from the platform. You can just download from the platform. And then the third one is the justification of the need for the, supp for the supplement of funds request. Now, as I understand it, this is just a little spreadsheet that they fill out. And again, I believe it's online and it's done through the NSF. So basically, it will take your US partner a matter of hours to do this. Um, uh, this this process and it just it's important that it must be submitted by the 22nd of September. Okay, so for further information, you can visit the the website here, and it, it gives some some good details, and it also has the contact points, um, so you you can uh, make direct contact. Okay, now if for some reason the DCL doesn't match the requirements, so for example, let's say your partner is not involved in any of those uh, wired or wireless programs, um, there may be other potential funds uh, that, that um, they might be able to avail of. And you know, uh, some examples of these could be, um, there's uh, some NSF cloud project running. <clears throat> And some of these have, have actually already uh, participated in some of the previous open calls. The Fabric Project uh, platform, I should say, um, they have, um, they will soon have a number of um, nodes uh, being uh, set up. Um, then that's on the, sort of on the wired uh, side. So it's the follow up from Genie platform, the uh, Enter platform and then fabric platform. Um, then there's also uh, in the program for advanced wireless research, you have a number of projects, the Cosmos project, um, which is coordinated by the University of Utah. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Un University of Rutgers um, and also Columbia University um, in the New York, um, New Jersey area. Powder Renew, which is um, University of Utah and AirPaw, AirPaw um, project. And what's interesting about the PAWR um, is that they have a supplemental fund, which is similar to the DCL, although it's not really a DCL um, per se. But the way this works is if, if you are an active NSF funded wireless researcher, and you have a proposal for a project, such as an NGI Atlantic project, which involves, you know, uh, wireless, um, you know, uh, platform experiments, uh, things like that. And you would like to experiment on these PAWR platforms. You can apply directly to. <laughs> Can you mute your phone, please? Thank you. Um, so you can um, you can apply directly to these platforms for a supplemental fund, and this uh, supplemental fund can be up to a maximum. The, 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 I'm sorry, the U.S. partner can can apply for this supplemental fund, and they don't have to be part of these uh, platforms. They can be any. US uh, researcher, but just keep in mind, they have to be, you know, the project has to be in relation to, you know, uh, some wireless technologies, or you could have wired and wireless technologies and do it that way as well. Um, but uh, with this particular fund, you can get a maximum of 50,000 US dollars, and you get full support from the actual platform themselves. So if you apply to the Cosmos platform, which is a um, city scale, smart city environment in, in the New York um, area, if you're accepted on that, not only would your US partner get 50,000 US dollars for the project, 
but you would also get uh, complete support from the Cosmos project themselves, which is you know, probably worth a significant um, amount of time in terms of effort. Okay. So there could be some scope to utilize this fund. In fact, it has been utilized in, in uh, our past open calls. And the website for it is, is given here. Okay, then um, another interesting one as well, um, if the other two are, are not of interest or are not, not applicable, um, there, there was re a recent funding of International Research and Education Network Connections, IRNC projects. And a large number of these projects have objectives directly related to collaboration with uh, international um, um, organizations, including EU partners. Now, um, it must be said that it's not just EU partners, it's also Asia, South America, um, you know, other countries as well. So, but it, it is a potential opportunity. And to get in, involved with these is, uh, or the, probably the quickest way would be to, to check in our twinning lab, because we've got a number of them to sign up in the twinning lab. Um, uh, a number of the projects um, to sign up there. there. Okay. And then uh, last, lastly, um, the ICT program, which um, was the initial program that was set up in the very uh, early days of NGI, uh, US EU Internet Core and Edge Technologies ICT program. Um, there might be a number of the research collaboration projects, which had a three-year duration. They might just be finishing, but it's our understanding that some of these may still have some funds available um, and could be looking for EU partners, okay? And again, we've got many of them to sign up to our twinning lab, so there could be some potential there. And the reason they still have funds um, it is sort of an interesting corollary to our project. Um, and it's because many of them, they, they received funding from the US through this program, but the EU at that point in time didn't have a fund. Um, we, we had not started yet. So a number of the um, EU partners in their projects were using funds from their existing in some cases, Framework Program 7 and then H2020 projects. And as those projects finished, um, many of these RC projects um, had remaining funds. And so they, they were able to um, extend, um, evidently in the US, they can extend much easier than we can in the EU, um, no cost extensions. So that's why some of them are actually sitting on you know, a pot of funds that they could perhaps uh, use to join up with an EU partner in ngiatlantic.eu. Okay. Um, so, um, Jim, before you continue, we had another uh, question from um, Akram. Okay. Actually, now we have two questions. So in the chat, okay. one was, the first one was from Akram was, can the project be performed by the EU partner in the lab of the host US partner during all the project period? In the project is the EU partner lab of the host US partner during all can project be performed by the EU partner in the lab. Yes, yes, that is possible, sure. Um, so, so as I understand, it, it would be the lab of the US partner, um, and the experiment would be in the US. Yes. Yes, that, that would be okay, Arkham. Uh, there that was a question, yeah, up. there was a question that came up, um, and I'll just address it here because it was actually the opposite of that, where <clears throat> um, someone had asked whether they could do the um, do the whole experiment in the EU and could the US partner be funded by NGI Atlantic to spend the whole time in the EU. And unfortunately, the answer to that is no, because we, we can only fund the EU partner for this. 
So, um, you know, the funding for the U.S. partner, whether they are in, in the U.S. or in the EU, is still going to have to come from the, the U.S. side. You know, uh, of course, the EU partner, if you have some ex, you know, funds for exchange of partners, you could use that, but it could not be put through our project because it's not in the spirit of the EU-US implementation agreement between the, uh, between the countries. Uh, we can only pay for the EU part, and then you know, the US partners have to have their own funds. So, but in, in this question, Akron, yes, you can. Um, in fact, that's, that's happened already where the, um, you know, the experiments are being conducted in the US side. You know, so that's, that's not a problem. Um, do you encourage collaboration with industry? Yes. Uh, does it make a difference? Get more or less points if two industrial partners join, but not an academic. Uh, again, it doesn't mean extra points. Um, you just have to explain, you know, the the partnership as you know as best that you can, and how you know the impact of the experiments, uh, the EU US experiments, are you know, promoting the NGI um, uh, results, you know, in whichever topic that you're doing. Um, but you, you do not have, uh, or you, you know, you don't have to have an academic, or if you have an academic, it's not going to result in less points, more points. You know, it's, it, it all depends on what your project is doing. Um, okay. For a full stay in the US part, is it possible to transfer the fund to us? Bank account during a stay in the US. The, the funds will only go from the coordinator bank account to the. I'm, I'm sorry, Jim. Before uh, answering the question, can you please read it? So it would be sure. also. Okay, we'll stay so in the, the, the next question is for full stay in the US partner. Is it possible to transfer the fund to us to US bank account during the stay in the US? No, it's not possible. What is the expected schedule of the payment? Is 40% for it's uh, 40, 40%, 45%, and 15%. And what are the fund expected dates for the fund transfer? Okay, so that's an easy one. If it's a six month project, it's 40% um, uh, after the midpoint. 45% at the end, and then there's 15% after the final, after the closest review of the project. Now, the reason we've had to do it this way is because of, it's a risk management issue, um, because it is possible that our project review could have some problems and it will be very difficult to recoup the monies back if we pay everyone 100%. But generally, there's only, you know, not very many months in between the, uh, the end of the projects and the uh, time of the, the next review period. So, so you shouldn't have to wait. It won't be a very long period of time, but that's, that's how we do the payment. So it's midterm end, and then very end, you know, um, a few months after, after our final review is satisfied. Um, but in terms of the, the funds, the, it's done just like a regular um, EU Horizon 2020 project. The coordinator, Waterford Institute Technology, will carry out the payments. They will go to the organization who is the EU coordinator. So that's why I say there's no way we can send it to a US bank account because the organization has to have a bank account in the EU. Okay. Um, and that's all the payments. So it'll go to the same bank account. It's, it's the same way it's done um, in, in H2020. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so we've had a number of questions. Um, that were sent. Thanks. Thanks, Ruben. Okay, so let me continue. <clears throat> so a, a number of questions were sent in advance of the um, 
of the webinar. So I'll, I'll just run through these um, and just keep an eye on the time. Is there any obligation for an academic partner to exist in the EU-based team? No, there isn't. Um, will two industrial partners, one EU, one US, be acceptable? Yes. Um, but again, please explain, you know, the the reason that you you have these two industrial partners, but it's absolutely fine. And, and in fact, it has already happened, you know, but please explain, you know, the experiment, um, the, the experiments that you're doing and, um, you know, if possible, it, it, you know, it would probably be better if you could try to find some, you know, one of these experimental platforms that we're mentioning, perhaps um, to connect with, you know, or maybe on the, the EU side, there's Fed for Fire Plus, so you might want to make some contact with, um, you know, with them as well, you know, or, or, you know, um, for, for your, your experimental um, project. How is the novelty of experiments in relation to the state of the art considered assessed? Um, what I would say here is please note that it's also the novelty and innovation potential of the NGI related results that are being experimented with and the novelty of having, having it experimented with transatlantic partners and the potential impacts of um, you know, experimenting with those. Um, now, what we generally tell um, uh, partners is that you don't necessarily have to you know, go straight from your experiments to the market, you know, but you should be able to you know, um, get results from your experiments um, that will assist you in moving closer to the market. Um, you know, so that if you can explain that, um, you know, that's sort of the novelty, um, that's, that's the kind of novelty um, that we're looking for, for, for running these experiments, okay? Um, and again, this next question was in relation to that, is, is this in the current open call remains relevant? Yes, it is, okay? Uh, how previous collaborations are assessed, taken into consideration, this is very important. So if you've had previous collaborations between the partners, absolutely, please uh, expand upon this. You know, however, you want to be doing something new. You can't be just um, repeating exactly what you've done before. So you must explain, you know, how these new NGI related experiments um, is considered a positive. And that's, that's how it's taken into consideration. How evaluators are aware of other NGI initiative results, for example, NGI explorers, success stories. This is a very important question. Uh, we recommend that you yourselves help the evaluators um, to become aware of them in your application. Okay, don't expect them to do the light work of searching for your successes. Um, you know, provide direct links and also some explanations, you know, and, and some you know, certainty to your information. Like there were a number of cases where, um, you know, people mentioned sort of in general, you know, we are going to use the Fed for Fire platform to, you know, carry out our experiments. But they never said, you know, which node, they, they didn't give any details of where or how. Or, so when the evaluators read that, you cannot expect them to go to Google and start Googling to, you know, figure out where you might be, you know, linking in with your experiments. So please, the more information you give them, you know, and it, it will uh, demonstrate the certainty of your, um, uh, the information in your application. And, and that's how they'll become aware of, of those um, success stories. Okay. And, um, and, and again, as, um, as Christina said earlier, we are open to all uh, NGI innovators, okay? Although we do our um, topic mapping similar to the topics in the NGI initiative, um, it's open to projects that have results coming from those initiatives, but also it's open to innovators who are working, you know, in those topics that are not in the NGI initiative um, family already. So we're open to all. Um, that's, that's very important to know. 
Um, uh, are the following documents uh, required when submitting a proposal? Okay, so yes, Declaration of Honor is has to be signed by the EU coordinator. Yes, and it has to be the legal signatory of the court, the EU coordinator. Um, and the uh, that's that can be found in our supplemental um, um, documentation section. And it's very straightforward. It's it's actually modeled after the H twenty twenty DOH. Okay. Then the letter of support, uh, which again is uh, available in the supplement documentation, has to be signed by each U.S. partner. Now, here it's only the principal investigator of the U.S. organization that needs to sign it. Um, we found in previous calls that this was continuously a humongous issue because to get the signatories from the legal departments of U.S. Uh, academia was taking months, if not years. So <clears throat> we we have um, we brought this requirement back to the principal investigator. So the principal investigator of the project team in the U.S. is sufficient. We do do further checks if the project is selected, of course. But you know, for the for the application, this is this is um, okay. And then the proposal. In PDF format. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they meant by this, but this is made available to you in the platform. You know, as soon as you submit, um, and possibly before you submit, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, Ruben, you might know that, <clears throat> but it certainly is. You know, after you submit, you can immediately download the PDF, and then um, this. And, and as I said earlier, this is what you you can use um, if your U.S. partner is applying to the DCL. And, and this also converts quite nicely into a Word document if you use Adobe Acrobat. Uh, in terms of lessons learned from previous calls, so <clears throat> we decided to do this multi-stream approach to attract more EU-US experimental platforms to interconnect for future projects. And that has been, you know, I, I would almost call it a, um, uh, like a, a bedrock of, of you know, what has happened because um, we, we, it's been quite successful and, and some platforms have been able to come together and then they, they've actually joined up with some, some other um, teams as well. So that that's, uh, quite a, has been quite a positive approach. Um, the additional topics, um, as Christina said, have been brainstormed and we've um, worked with the USNSF uh, uh, on this because now they're they're um, becoming more involved with us uh, through their DCL. So they're, they're you know, getting involved in the selection. And of course, there's making sure that the topics that are selected are fitting within their own programs. Um, and a good example is the, the one that uh, Christina mentioned that's data sharing specifically for cybersecurity um, and um, you know, looking at um, what uh, attack type data and ransomware type type information. So they, you know, they have a program which is looking at this and they would like to team up with um, EU partners on this topic. Then um, the dedicated opportunity for NSF funding for uh, the US partners if they're already involved. Um, but please note that the calls are also open to all US based partners, even those without DCL funding. You know, so again, as I said earlier, you don't get extra points if you have DCL funding. Every every application is um, is evaluated independently of this, and you know, just but please explain um, the U.S. partners' funding source in the application. Okay, then uh, the other change um, in our first set of open calls, we had another category which uh, went up to 150,000 euros, but because of two reasons, um, the first being that it's for the DCL um, uh, maximum amount of funds, um, it being 100,000, um, we decided that we would um, uh, only go up to a maximum budget of 75,000 euros. That's the first reason. The second reason as well is 
we're putting a greater emphasis on funding more innovators in uh, you know, larger numbers of US projects that we can fund because we're using the, you know, this um, lower maximum. In, in the previous calls, we, you know, we were sort of expecting to have like a half and half um, um, I just realized that you couldn't see me. We were expecting to have a uh, you know half and half of the large, uh, 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 longer term and short term, but in actual fact, most people went for the longer term, and you know uh, we we wanted to give more opportunities to the innovators um, in our calls. Uh, then just some other things, as I mentioned before, the uh, declaration of honor. Uh, must be submitted with the application, but signed only by the EU coordinator legal rep, and then the US can be the PI um, in letter of support. And both of these are downloadable, and you can get them uh, signed uh, pretty quickly. And then uh, details on past and or present NGI applications and EU 20 applications. This, um, I want to be very clear on this. We're not doing this. Um, and evaluating on this. The, the reason that we're asking for this is twofold. Number one, um, if you're involved in other NGI projects, um, the NGI projects themselves do a coordination between each other. Okay, so we're checking to see, you know, um, if, if um, a team has put into, you know, NGI uh, Pointer and NGI Atlantic, you know, we, we need to know that um, that, that the teams are, are, are putting, putting proposals into two, um, into two um, of our projects. Um, that's not a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not saying there's any problem with that, but we just need to look at things like, you know, double funding, if that's a, you know, a po possibility, and also more importantly, a capacity issue. Um, that, that, that the team has a capacity, has the capacity to carry out both of those projects if they're both successful. And this actually happened where we had a, um, uh, there was a team that were um, in a successful project in one of the other NGI calls and in ngiatlantic.eu. And then we did this analysis uh, with the assistance of the, the team, um, both the uh, NGI team and also the project team. And we were able to determine that A, it was not double funding because there were two totally, totally different projects, but there was a, what we felt to be a capacity issue if the project were running at the same time. So with the uh, agreement of the, the team, we just, um, we had them start uh, in the other NGI project first. And then when they finished that project, they then started NGI Atlantic. So we're, we're just doing this analysis, and that's why we ask you to please let us know about any other NGI applications. The EU H2020, this is a statistic that the European Commission wants. And again, it's not you know, anything that's uh, being shared, or, but what they would like, what they're trying to do is they're trying to determine the participants in the NGI uh, program. They'd like to see, what percentage of those have not participated in H2020 or similar programs? Because one of the, the sort of selling points of NGI is that um, they're, they're happy that, you know, they're through having these easier applications through the open calls, it'll remove the administrative burden that you normally have in H2020 program and you know, other programs. So, the innovators that are coming to NGI could potentially be ones that steer away from the more um, mundane, um, bureaucratic H2020. So they're trying to keep track of that, to, you know, just from a statistical perspective, you know, to see is it 50% um, are coming to NGI that have never been involved in H2020, is it you know, 60%? And, and the higher it is, the happy they are because they, they wanna see what they call the non-usual suspects participating. Um, so, so that's why we ask this information. So don't, you know, don't 
feel worried about it, just answer it. Um, and, and it's just being used for, for our own uh, statistics. Um, and, and we're going to find out anyway, because um, in terms of the NGI, because as I mentioned, we go through a process regularly to, you know, to check between our, um, our uh, other sister projects to see, you know, who they they had in, in successful projects. Um, the other thing as well, over three open call or two of the first two open calls, we did have some scope for negotiation uh, in terms of the general agreement, which um, uh, which, which is issued to the winning project, the coordinator of the winning projects. So we went through the, the learning curve for all different types of organizations, you know, ranging from the very small up to, you know, the very large, um, you know, traditional and some non-traditional uh, type research centers. So we basically now have fixed on a general agreement. It, it's actually quite similar to uh, the H2020 agreement, but of course, specifically for the NGI program, and it's no longer negotiable because it just, uh, you know, as I said, we've covered, you know, dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's. We've gone through every single um, um, possible, you know, nuance for any type of an organization that we could potentially come up against. And so there would be no more negotiations. Uh, it just was, you know, it would take too long. and it, It's not fair on it, everyone concerned. Okay, so please, look at the documents you know beforehand they're all there now because there won't be any negotiations um, on, on the uh, general agreement okay um, then we have added some additional fields to include resources for multi-eu team applications um, and there's a clear format of the downloadable pdf as i mentioned which can be converted to word um, quite nicely Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Jim, before you continue, because it's already 5 p.m. Uh, there was another question from Martin Serrano. Okay. And I think also yes, Paolo Di Francesco is commenting something. Yes. Um, I probably can't go into the detail on this, Martin, now, but <clears throat> if if you look at the text in the uh, on the website, um, what what the what B three is more covering is the when you, they're talking about data portability in terms of services and applications. Okay, if the data share then in B five, which was the one that was suggested by the um, the NSF, um, because they have a platform, I believe it's called Deter, D-E-T-E-R. And what, what that um, topic is more addressing is the uh, you know, international data sharing for the purposes of uh, improving cybersecurity specifically. Okay, so you know, looking at attack vectors, you know, sharing data you know, between um, you know, EU and US organizations to, to try to improve the, um, you know, the, the cybersecurity aspects in particular, okay? Whereas the other B3 is more, you know, uh, looking at, um, you know, the different um, you know, data models for um, services and applications that are GDPR compliant. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not answering it into the, the detail that, that you want, Martin, but I think if, um, if, if, if you, you know, look, look at the text, the, the longer version of the text on the website, and then if you have more questions, please come back to me. Um, and then in addition to that, at the workshop in June that we had with the NSF, it was an EU-US workshop, we went into more detail and the NSF actually presented that topic and the reason that they wanted that topic to be included. So if you could you know, watch that presentation, I think it would make it, um, make it a bit more clearer, okay?
Also, Jim Paolo Di Francesco was asking about the Tuning Lab. Um, yes, we have received uh, the um, dev register to be published on the Tuning Lab. Yes, I think the registration from yesterday. So you will be, um, uh, you know, published on the on the platform in the next week, probably on the coming days. And uh, he's yes. also asking if we will be um, uh, the CVs. Uh, yeah, what I mean there is you don't have to, um, you know, attach your CV. Just um, in in the application itself, it um, we've been asking for partners to, you know, indicate the short CVs of the participants. You know, on in both the EU and the US. So the typical, like, you know, one paragraph uh, or a couple of sentences, because it, it sort of puts, uh, you know, puts a name and, and um, information on the people uh, into the hands of the evaluators. And, and that really helps, helps them understand who, you know, who's doing what. And, and the resources and, you know, what the resources are being spent on. Um, okay. Okay. Um, there, there's an awful lot of frequently asked questions here, but maybe I'll just, I'll just cover this one. Um, well, hold on. Sorry. I seem to have lost my. Oh, here we go. Um, maybe I'll just finish with this one, and then we're going to share the um, the slide set. And the, there's probably another twenty slides with with many many questions that and answers that you can look at. Um, so, in terms of the travel, um, what we normally in normal times we would recommend, you know two, uh, at least two travels, one for maybe the initial setup and one for uh, maybe the, you know, experiments, um, you know, if it's a six month project, we could even possibly do three, have an interim experiment and then final experiment. But, you know, due to the, um, the you know, ongoing COVID-19 crisis uh, and the block on travel is still happening, um, Hard to believe, but it is. Um, so the um, what we're saying is that you could you could you you could put in the application in case things would suddenly improve. Of course, you could put in for the travel um, as you you know, would normally do, and then if it happens that it's not possible. We are showing some flexibility in um, transferring the travel budget to personnel budget, which you can then, um, because you're going to be doing it remotely anyway. Okay. So I think uh, with that, Ruben, because of the time, I don't think we can go much, much longer. Yeah, yeah. Just um, I was asking, uh, can you please um, give the recording video and the slides before the end of the weekend? Uh, yes. we, will, we will try to have them online actually already this evening, maybe in two hours, you will find them on the website. We will, when, okay. when they're online, we will publish on Twitter, saying that uh, you can find them on the web page. Um, okay. Also, thank I, you. As thank I said, there's many, many, there's many, many other questions. Um, and, and there's there's actually more on the website as well. And, and if, you, if you have questions, you can send it, you know, either to contact, um, you know, or you could send directly to us, um, and we'll get back to you ASAP. Okay. So uh, with that, I would like to thank everybody, and we'll get the recording and the and the slides up um, as soon as we can. Okay. So thank you all and have a, a very great weekend and, and good luck with your applications. Thank you all and thank you, Jim, also. Okay. Thank, thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye. Have a good rest of the day and good luck with your applications. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, folks. Thank you.